I have my three chocolates again, and I won't make up the questions this week. I actually spent some time in my office this morning just thinking up three questions that you won't be able to answer so I can keep the chocolates. <laughs> Should I just keep them? <laughs> now, I want you to know that I'm keeping them. <clears throat> So let's see how far back you can go knowing your Old Testament. In the church of Pergamum, it says they were, when Jesus writes to them in the church, he says, you have done what, what Balaam did in this church. So let me ask you, Cherie's already nodding, so I'm not going to look her away. What did Balaam do that got Pergamum into trouble? What did he teach to the king of Moab? Well done. You could almost get two chocolates for that, but I'm not that generous. <laughs> See, you've got to learn to pay attention. So right in chapter 1, we heard when, when um, John turned around and he saw this picture of Jesus, and then it said, the second time it said, John, write this. I hold the seven stars and the seven lampstands. What are the seven stars and what are the seven lampstands? What are the seven spirits then? Or the, is that close enough? Mike's saying, no, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you got half of it right, so share with Michael. <laughs> so the seven stars we said were the angels of the church or the seven spirits, as he's saying. But it's actually the angels or the leaders of the church, but we don't quite know. And the lampstands are the actual churches themselves. And so it's reminding us that Jesus walks amongst his churches and he is the king of the churches. And so we need to take ownership of that. What is the difference in the attitude between the Ephesian church and the Pergamum church towards the Nicolaitans? Almost. <laughs> okay, what's the difference between the two? So we have the church in Ephesus and we have the church in Pergamum. What did the church in Ephesus do? Rosita? Almost, but not to do with the Nicolaitans. Ashley. Okay, so which is the first one? <laughs> see, you can see she's a psychologist. She knows how to worm things. So Ephesus didn't want them, and Pergamum entertained them. Let's move on. Enjoy your chocolates. Don't eat them during the service. The church of Sardis. We continue in our series, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. So last week, when we looked at the church last week, it was a church that had compromised. A church that had allowed its understanding of God's word and what it was called to do to, to be distracted in a way and to compromise what they believed. Today we look at a church that for me was in a way even in deeper, deeper trouble. More serious issue that they had. They were caught in complacency. They weren't struggling. When we've looked at Thyatira and we looked at Pergamum and Ephesus, we see churches that were in persecution. We church, saw people that were being slandered, people in poverty, people struggling. They had none of that. But they became complacent in a way in their freedom, in the fact that they could just do what they needed to do. And I want to say to you that complacency is the silent thief of our faith. We don't even see it coming. We, we don't even feel it sneaking up. But before we know it, we have become complacent just as them. Too often we rely so much on the stuff we see. The only word I can really use, that stuff we hold on to so tightly, we put so much confidence in that, not in the gospel, that we begin to move away from the gospel and, and become complacent. And we forget what we have been called to do. Sadly, for some of us, we get to a point like this church did, where they really just didn't care anymore. The church is okay, we're all happy, we all smile at each other, finances are good, everything works, but they just don't care. They just don't care that God has called us to something more. God has called us to the gospel. We just don't care. It's like some of you that I do see, don't think I don't see you. It's like some of you that sleep while I'm preaching. Now, I hear those guilty laughs. 
It's, a, it's so comfortable in here. It's nice and warm and everything's fine. We've just had a cup of coffee and it was really good. And I'm going on and on and on like last week. Yeah, the sermon's so long and things are just so comfortable and we just doze off. I wonder how many Christians have just dozed off. Instead of keeping their eyes open, being watchful to what God has called us to, we've dozed off. The city of Sardis had dozed off to what God had asked it to do. And it became complacent without even realizing it. You know, there's some churches, and, and I pray we would never be one of these, There are some churches that still believe that they are alive and functioning and relevant because they meet every week. Because they get together every Sunday. But I want to say to you, getting together every Sunday doesn't mean you're a a live church. That just means you're a bunch of people that get together to sing sing some songs and maybe listen to a sermon. But if somebody had to walk past and switch the power off outside, nobody would even notice that the church was gone. I've shared this before. Well, it's a concern of mine. Will this neighborhood or this community or Port Elizabeth or the world even notice if we decide in a, and I'm going to say a very short meeting after this, because I want to keep it short, would all those things ever notice if we decided in our meeting in a little while that we're shutting the doors tomorrow? Would the world notice? Or would it just be again, there used to be a building there, now it's a shopping mall. I wonder what it was. Would our kids notice that we faded away into oblivion? So church in Sardis had that look. Everything looked good, but it was dead. And Jesus, the head of the church, the one who walks amongst the churches according to chapter 1, the one who holds the leadership of the churches in his hand and holds them accountable in his support and protection of them, he holds them accountable as he does the churches full authority over us, he says to this church, if you don't shape up, I'm going to pull the plug and I'm going to shut you down. My mind, when I think of that, always goes to that that incredible book, which I'm getting to one day, the book of Malachi, where, where Malachi says to the church, you're not giving me or giving God what is the best of what you should give and I'm going to close the doors. And before I do that, I'm going to take dung or feces and I'm going to spread it on your faces. It's what God says to his church in Malachi. Maybe he's saying the same thing to Sardis. I'm going to shut you down. And so as we we read this letter this morning and we dig into it a little bit, it might seem a bit harsh at times. But each one of us, especially on this letter, because I believe complacency is rife in the church. I want to ask you, your personal journey with Jesus this morning, consider it. How was this past week? How's the past two or three months or the last year? How was this morning when you woke up? How was your personal journey with Jesus? Was it a, almost a case of, oh, I've got to go to church again? Or was it, I've got to go to church again? See, that talks of our attitude towards Jesus and the gospel and what he called to us. Evaluate your own faith. And then in that too, because of your journey, evaluate your commitment to Westway. Or we've got visitors from other churches. What is your commitment to the church? Remember, that's not the building. Talking about this group of people, we are the church. What is your commitment to Jesus' church, the local church and then the church universal? Are you sold out for it? Maybe this morning you might just realize, you know what, I look really good, but actually I'm dead. Inside is just dry. I will tell you, and I think I shared this with you, that a couple of months ago, this is how I was feeling. That inside I was just dry. There was nothing left to give. But God is good. And you've got to have the right people to talk to and the right people just to encourage you. Maybe your job in the church is, be, is to be called to encourage somebody. Maybe when we eat a, a fed cook just now, or a curry bunny, Jordan, not a fed cook with mince. But when you eat that, maybe your job today is to go to somebody you've never met and say to them, Jesus loves you. Whatever you're going through, Jesus knows. Whatever it is, let's become a church that isn't complacent about sharing what God is laying on our hearts. Because we can lose out on so much ministry time, so much effective work for him. This church missed it. And so as usual, I've asked somebody to read. Ashley's got like so many jobs this morning. 
Ash, will you come and read for us? Chapter 3 of Revelation from verse 1 to 6. There we go. Yes. <laughs> you haven't been listening. How many times have I said Sardis? I'm just making 100% sure. <laughs> okay. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Thank you. I think, can you just echoing to you as well? Let's move on then to the city. As we try and do every week, we try and pick up some historical fact around the city. And so John writes to the angel of the church in Sardis. So Sardis was the capital city of Lydia at that time, founded around about 1,200 years after Jesus had died. And one of its main characteristics was it sat on top of like a, a plateau, almost like a table mountain, around about 500 meters high, between 450 and 500 meters high. So this was quite a serious mountain. And the, all the sides were extremely steep, so it was considered an impregnable town for the enemy. They couldn't get into the town or onto this hill, but there was only one road access to get up to the top of this hill. And in that impregnable state, the city became apathetic. The city became indifferent. The city became soft. It was a city that was known for its luxury and its wealth. But they were apathetic. They had no real conviction of anything. They were immoral and they were occultic in so many of their practices. Temples to fertility goddesses, just like so many of the other churches we've looked at. One thing I found interesting was it supposedly was the hometown or the birthplace of Aesop. Now, probably if you're over 40, you will know who Aesop was. Anybody under that has no idea, am I right? So Aesop wrote Aesop's fables. They still don't know. Many of us grew up on those kind of stories. He supposedly came from there. It was supposedly the place where they minted some of the first coins. It was a place of dying as well, of not dying as in dead, dying as in dying cloth. They worked with carpets, they worked with wool, and they worked with cloth. One of the greatest cities of the time. It was supposed to have been one of the wealthiest. I don't know if you've heard of the King Croesus. And he was the king at that time, and he made them extremely wealthy. And in that wealth brought complacency. In that wealth brought this indifference. They were complacent. They thought, our city is so wealthy, our city is so powerful, our city is impregnable, nobody can get into it. What do we have to worry about? But see, one day they took off or took their eyes off the prize. Just as a little while later, we'll touch on wake up. They lost their guarded nature. They lost the ability to watch out for trouble. And Cyrus the Persian came to take them on. And they all sat at the top and they thought, we are impregnable, we don't need to watch or we don't need to prepare ourselves for battle. And uh, what history says to us is that one night they were all sitting watching, trying to work out how to get up these, these steep cliffs into the city. One of the guards supposedly dropped his helmet. He must have been looking down the cliff. His helmet fell off. And they thought, oh, well, that's his helmet gone. But they watched him climb down a hidden path. And the soldiers that were surrounding the mountain saw the soldier. And when he went back up in the dead of night, they all went up that hidden path into the city. And they destroyed it. They took their eyes off the prize. See, they lost their vigilance. The city was restored under Alexander the Great and destroyed again. Then... So we try and read. Antiochus the Great also came. 
all these guys into the city, and each time we see it was because they lost their vigilance. And then finally, under the reign of Tiberius, an earthquake, and the city was gone. But during this time, the Romans have arrived, and they, they rebuilt this, the city to become wealthy again, but not as, as wealthy as it was under Croesus, but still again, strange how things happen, and we say, okay, we're never going to do that again. COVID came, and we said, when COVID finishes, we'll all be different. No, we're not. We're doing exactly what we did before. When I think of 9-11 in the States, probably, I think it's over 20 years already. And, and we saw today, today, we saw how the churches grew and people flocked into the churches and it was like this wave of faith. If you go to America today, that's forgotten. They just get back into their complacency and they're just comfortable in what they did. And this church, the city, went back. And the city was slowly dying. It lived on its proud reputation. Jesus writes about its reputation. It's not something we make up. They lived on the proud reputation of what they had done before. All the things that had come in the past. But that's all it had left. And inside it was dead. The city had died and the church within Sardis had taken on exactly the same attitude as the people. And so if we just open it up a little bit for us, when we look under COVID, how many of us as Christians took on the same attitude as them out there? Who were all fearful and afraid without hope, terrified of what was going to happen, where we should be as Christians being away embracing some of that because it opened so many doors. Or we can say, well, it doesn't matter what happens. I am a person of hope because I hope in Christ, not in the world. And so this church took those same attitudes on and the city was dying. So that's where we find this church, on this hilltop in a way. Let me move on and the writer comes. This is Jesus just revealing himself. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. All he's doing here is again presenting himself, Jesus saying, I am the one. I am the one. I am the authority. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's cementing that to this church. He's saying to them, I am the authority. And so if I speak, you better listen. Just as for us, if we open God's word and he's giving us a word, we better listen to what he's giving us. Not argue around it. He says, I am the one who has the seven spirits. I am the one who has these seven lampstands. I am the one who looks after everything, and I'm speaking, and I'm writing to you because of your lackadaisical, complacent attitude. As he says that, I'm the one over this church. He's reminding us that we run this church and every other church, not on our own understanding, but I would say to you as best as I could, we run this church under the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. That's where we have to be, under his authority, not our own. So we need a church family, we need leadership, we need people submitted to the authority of Jesus. Not living under our own strength, living on our laurels by our reputation. If we become or are a church led by the Spirit, we will see life and growth. But if we're a church led by our own understanding, all we will see is disaster. And it's happened to so many churches who've taken their eyes off who is head of the church. And so that that simple line reminds us that the king is speaking to us, the head of the church. Then he goes on to the criticism. So far, if you remember, all the churches we've done, we've first gone to the writer, and then we've said the well done's. There is no well done here. There is no well done at all. But he goes straight into the criticism. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. There's no well done. No, I'm watching you and I've seen what you've done and you're getting things right. There's just, you look alive, but you are dead. I, I was reading this, this little picture this, um, during the week and I thought it would work for us because it happens to so many churches. You can see this picture in your head of this person crawling in the desert, dying of thirst. The desert is hot. They're close to, to death. Their tongues are hanging out. Their skin has been burnt. And as they come over this sand dune, there's this big sign. 
that says there's cool, clear, life-giving water just a few kilometers ahead. And that boosts your energy. It boosts this, this dying man's energy, and he begins to crawl over the hills, over the sand dunes, new hope, new expectation of this water. And if it's you or somebody you're picturing in your mind arrives at this place where the sign said there would be water, and there's another sign that says, come in, the water is waiting for you, come in and drink. And there in front of you, as you come into this building, you come through our front doors into this part, the sanctuary, and there's this well in the middle. And all you can think of is this fresh, clear water that's going to revive your spirits and renew your strength. You can't wait. And as you come in, we don't, this place doesn't have plastic chairs like we have. They have those chairs like a few privileged people have. Those soft cloth chairs. Now you can lift your feet up. Soft carpets, nice cushions to kneel on. The lighting is soft. Everything is perfect for you to be renewed. And there's a bucket standing next to this well. And you take the, well, the bucket and you drop it in. And all you can imagine is this bucket hitting that water. And you hear it clang when it hits the bottom. And you pull the bucket up. And there's nothing in it but dust. That's the church of Sardis. It had everything that made it look successful, but no life. No living water for people. Dust that doesn't quench. Dust that doesn't renew or heal or refresh. All it does is make you thirstier. All it does is possibly make you sicker. Sick spiritually so that your hope in Christ, your hope in a way, even in the church, is destroyed. And I think, oh, Barry, that's such a sad story. But it's a picture of the church. Not just Sardis. It's a picture of so many churches today. They look so good. I was in back of my head is they, they look so good because they eat so good or they taste so good. I don't know why that's in my head. But these churches look so good. And then you go in and there's nothing. Absolutely nothing. How many people do you know or can imagine that have been into Jesus' church Maybe it's Westway. Have been into Jesus' church looking for life-giving water. And all they find is dust. All they find is rituals and traditions and religious spirits and an old reputation of what we used to do. There are so many churches that have that, that kind of picture to us. And we've got to be so careful because it can happen in our church. You know, we begin to live in the things we did yesterday, those glory days. You remember in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s when most of us weren't around and things were so good, the church was strong and people were coming in and there were choirs and we were, things were going well. You remember those days? They were good. The problem is they're not, yeah. That's not the time we live in. And so we can't live in what we did. We use what we did yesterday to equip us for today so we can be better tomorrow. That's what we used yesterday. We don't live in yesteryear. And we can't keep saying to each other, but we used to do it like this. Well, well done. But we can't do it like that anymore. I was in a, 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 a training session about two weeks ago. And one of the, the guys who I respect as a doctor of theology, but he was saying the problem with the church is that we, we don't sing hymns anymore, we sing choruses. And I'm thinking to myself, that, that's a great point, but it's not the right one. There's nothing wrong with singing hymns, but if you only want to sing hymns in the church, we're going to have no people. Maybe some older folk, maybe some younger folk. But we can't keep doing yesterday's stuff today. We've got to move on. But our churches are full of people that say, but look what we used to do. And all I can say to many of them is, but for many years you have done nothing. You have done nothing but live on the laurels of yesterday. And the church moves into complacency. Past successes don't help us today. This building is great, but it doesn't help us. We have great material things. We don't have soft chairs, but we have chairs. 
Maybe when people walk in, they look around our church and they say, well, you've got really good decor because some churches are seriously good. Maybe we have a great worship team. Maybe our door stewards, when you walked in, was like, yeah, this church has got friendly people at the door. Maybe some walk in and say, that guy that preached today can really preach. We need to go back there. And everyone is speaking around the church. Everybody's excited about what's going on. But when they dig deep, there's only dust. See, this stuff can attract people, but it doesn't help save people. The gospel saves people. And that's what reveals our life. That is what reveals our passion and our call. Sardis lost it because it was complacent in everything it had except Jesus. Be careful what you perceive to be life. As you look around you, be careful what you perceive to be life in the church. Because reputations aren't everything. I might shock some of you now. Do you know Westway's got a reputation? In the Baptist Union? Do you know that? It's not a good one. Do you know when I got the call to come to this church, people on the Baptist Union executive said to me, you're going to Westway, why? Westway kills pastors. Do you know that? The Groot Kokodure van the Baptist Union Believe that Westway kills pastors. That's not a good reputation to have. Our reputation should be Westway loves Jesus. And Westway is involved in the gospel. So when you walk in and you see gospel-centered, Christ-focused, mission-determined, that is who we are. I love being at Westway. I really do. I don't believe you yet to destroy me. I believe we are yet together to honor Jesus. That's what we must be looking for. Reputations can be good and they can be bad, but we cannot live on them. We've got to live on what we're doing. And so I've written here, if Westway wants to have this reputation, let it be one that honors God. Let it be a reputation that says we honor each other. Let it be a reputation that says we honor God's church, that we honor the gospel that we honor the truth. Let that be our reputation. Not that pastors come here to be destroyed. So the writer gives us then some help. Where if you're in this lack of life or you maybe got this tainted reputation, how do you fix it? Well, the fourth point, the remedy for us. So he says to him, you, you guys have got a good reputation, but you're dead. But if you want to fix it, this is what you do. Verse 2, wake up. And my mic switched off. Wake up. <laughs> Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. And so I'm not going to forget these three because I've got five. Five quick things that he says we must do. First, it's very easy. Wake up. The, the other translations, yours might say, be watchful. Be watchful. What, watch what is going on around you. It's like sitting on that hill, keeping watch for the enemy. Watch for them. Be awake. Don't fall asleep. The guards that are guarding the doors or the, the life of this church, make sure you are vigilant. See, the church, every church, every church starts with a vision. Every church. We have this vision. Are we going to plant a church in this certain area, just like Westway was planted? And we see people actively working for Christ, loving the gospel, wanting to share the gospel. And so they say, we're going to plant a church, but we need a building. So we, I've shared this. We buy a piece of ground, and then we build a building. And then if you've got a church, you must have a pastor. You've got to have some trained person, some equipped clergy to preach to us. And slowly but surely, the people come in and the church gets bigger and bigger and the church is alive. And then something happens. Then something happens. And the people get distracted. 
They begin to watch other things. They begin to look out for other signs, maybe for other signs and wonders. And the vision that they started with is lost. Now it's all about maintaining what we've built, not the calling on our lives. And when we begin to lose the vision of what is ahead, we live in the past. If we lose the vision of what should be ahead, we're living in the past. And complacency is there. Instead of our eyes being open, we're dozing. We're sitting in the chairs or in the pews, dozing. So we need to be watchful. Secondly, we need to, as he said, revive what is dying. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. The great thing that he's saying here is, this church, Sardis, that I'm saying he's dead, he's not beyond redemption. He's not so dead that I cannot put life into it again. It can be revived, it can be renewed, it can be restored. There are still some things that you are doing that will help you. Revive them. He says, I found your deeds unfinished. So what things did you start that you've lost the vision and the passion for that God's asking you to redo? Or start again. Refresh them. You might be in that place right now as you're sitting here. Where you might be like the church in Sardis. Where I was a couple of weeks or months ago. Feeling that just that weight of not having anything left. But God is good. God is gracious. And when we reach out to Him. And we ask Him to revive our spirits. He does that. And I would ask you, if maybe you're feeling like that, ask God to reactivate your faith. To reactivate your passion. When we go back to Ephesus, remember, repent, and return. Remember what Jesus has done. Maybe there were times where you were spending so much time in Scripture, reading and studying and learning, but you've stopped. Maybe you loved worship in whatever form that took for you. Maybe you were a person, a real prayer warrior, who spent so much time on your knees praying for the church and for God's people and for the lost. Maybe it's just fellowship. I feel for so many of our older folk that during COVID just lost the fellowship of people. And sadly, we saw many of them die. They died because they just had nothing. And they gave up all hope. If you want to revive what God is calling you to do, it's going to take some work. It isn't easy to start the journey again. Sometimes you've got to just get up at 4 o'clock every morning and say, I'm going to read the Word today as a habit. The interesting thing is that habit very quickly becomes a desire. The more time you spend doing it. Let me ask you, what has God called you to do? You. Donna and I went to the Activate conference with, with um, Francois and Fabian and Ian and them yesterday. And Mike Bernard was talking around, what are you consecrated to do? And we've touched on consecration when we went through the book of Joshua. What has God asked you specifically? So when I look at these faces around here, every one of you, God has called to something. Not everybody's called to preach. Not everybody's called to lead worship or whatever. But God has a plan for every single one of us and a task. What is your task? Maybe it's something you started years ago. When you first got saved, you were excited and passionate and you started a ministry or you started getting involved, but slowly but surely you become disillusioned or distracted. What is God calling you to revive? Thirdly, remember. So we watch, we revive, and we remember. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. What have we heard? The gospel. Every one of us, if you sit here and you are born again, if you are a born again believer, I'm not saying if you're a Christian, because we've spoken around now for many, that doesn't mean anything. Are you a born again believer in Jesus Christ? If you are, you have heard the gospel. At some stage, God did an incredible work in your life, a work of grace. Can you remember that? Can you remember as you look back, as I look back at my life before the pastor of a, a, a sinner, a sinner heading towards death in desperate, desperate need of salvation, knowing when I look back now 
Then I didn't know it, but I know now when I look back that my heart was inherently evil and still leads me astray. Do I remember that? Do I remember that there was a time when I rejected God and wanted nothing to do with Him because He would destroy all my fun? The things I wanted to do for me, He was saying I couldn't, so why should I follow Him in truth? But God sent His Son. He sent His one and only Son to die for me at Calvary. Jesus says, never forget that. Never forget what you have heard. The Ephesian church, when Paul wrote to that, he said, you heard this and you believed it and you hold on to it. The forgiveness of your sin, that deposit of the Holy Spirit put into you. Chapter 1, verse 13. Don't forget who you were and who you are now. Who made this life real to you? Who changed who you were? See, if we don't remember what we were, we can very quickly become prideful and self-centered. And we've begun the road of complacency because our passion is gone. You've heard the gospel, you've accepted the gospel, and you were reborn by the gospel. Remember that. And so as he moves on, he says, remember what you heard. He goes to the next one, and he says, fourthly, resolve to be obedient. Now, this is a challenge for many of us. We have to take it consciously onto ourselves and say, I'm going to obey what I believe. So whether that's part of the word or what God's calling you to, I'm going to obey it no matter what, no matter how hard it is, no matter how much it hurts or how much I don't want to do it, I will obey it. Because I will not take my eyes off the prize. I will not be distracted through my own sinful nature that is leading me astray. We want to be in a place where the things that my heart will lead me to, I'm I'm watchful of them. See, the problem is when we take our eyes off what Jesus did, we learn very quickly how to justify our sin. I could say to you now, right now, how many of you right now, in this past week or whatever, justified something you did wrong? You don't have to put your hands up. I don't want to embarrass you. But many of us could probably say, I justified something I did wrong because I wanted to do it. Because that's what our heart says. If you want to do it, well, do it. You see, God is good because God will forgive me. Don't we cheapen grace so quickly? shared with you before, when somebody said to me, I'm going to sleep with my friend's wife, will God forgive me? Let's not be distracted by justifying our sin. Resolve to be obedient. Deliberate obedience is not good. You see, we can push God's grace for so long. I want to say to you, if right now, You're justifying sin to satisfy your desires. Remember what Jesus did for you. Remember what Jesus did for you. And make a conscious decision to be obedient. Stay away from all semblances of evil. Stay away from it. It's never too late. So says, as you become obedient, then comes this interesting one, the last one, the fifth point, repent of your sin. That's a change of our heart attitude towards the things of God, getting our minds right. Remember, sin doesn't start in our heart, it starts in our heads. And we think stuff, and our, and our head says, you can do this. The scripture that says you can't doesn't really say that. See, that's how we justify so many things. Well, the interpretation of the Greek and the Aramaic says that Bob was Billy. You know, that kind of stuff. Or Bob can be Diana. That kind of stuff. We've got to get our minds right, focused on obedience to God's word, remembering what Jesus did and why he did it. We're going to have to make a conscious choice. See, we can tell you, I can preach this from the frontier for the next five years until you are ready to make a conscious choice to be obedient to what God did, you will walk in sin. 
That's your choice. Only you can make it. If you are struggling with complacency right now, you've got to watch, set up your guards. You've got to revive what God had called you to. You've got to remember what he did. Resolve to be obedient. And if you have fallen, repent. And then start at number one again. And just follow through each of them. But, but, I love buts and therefores. Because this is like the, the warning coming into us now. But if you do not wake up, if you do not repent, if you do not revive, if you do not remember, if you do not do those things, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come for you. As I read this, there's a command to us. Not a suggestion or if you feel like it, a command. Get yourselves back in right standing. Get yourselves back into the apple of God's eye position. Get off the complacency train today. Now, make that decision. If we refuse, that's what he's saying here. But if you don't, there's consequences. Jesus was saying to the church in Sardis, if you don't get busy sorting out your complacent attitude, these are my words now, if you don't get busy sorting out your complacent attitude, I, Jesus, the one who holds the Holy Spirit, the church leaders, the churches themselves in my hand, I am the head of the church. I, Jesus, will come. I will come, and you won't even know when. I'll just come, and I will remove your lampstand and finally, you will be completely and totally dead. That's a harsh consequence for any church. Because you're not even going to know. It's just going to be, for me, it's going to be this time you're going to wake up one day and realize we are just nothing. Nothing we do has value. In Judges 16, verse 20, we see Samson, this man of God, set apart for God. God had everything given to this man and we've looked at Samson before and he's, he was not a nice man. If you're one of those who believes that Samson was a really great guy, he wasn't. He was an absolute rotter. But it says in Judges 16 verse 20, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. He did not know that the Lord had left him. What an indictment on a church that we could be doing everything we do, thinking we're doing so well, but we don't know that God has left us and the lampstand has been removed. If you do not start this journey, I will remove my lampstand from you. But, but again, but there are few people, yet there are few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes, they will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. So there's this challenge, this, if you don't, this is the consequence, but if you do, this is the blessing. And he's two kinds of people here. The blessing for those who've stood firm, who've said, we will not soil our clothes with this complacency or the false teachings when we look at all the other churches. Those who stand firm, those who are the remnant, my faithful servants, I will bless. And I will work with them. If you look, if you desire my presence, if you are determined to pursue my power and my promises, driven to achieve my plans and my purposes, John 20, if that is you, those who stand firm on God's word, remembering what Jesus has did, turning their lives around to come back to him, those who seek God and stand firm, Jesus says, you will walk with me in heaven. You will talk with me in heaven. You will spend eternity with me. And so let me ask you, are you standing firm? Are you standing firm or are you justifying something that you shouldn't be doing? Then he goes on and says, the one who is victorious will like them be dressed in white. Those, when he's saying those who are victorious, he's saying those, we've said those who've stood firm, those who are repentant, 
those who've turned from their sin, I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and His angels. If you are repentant, if you come back to Christ, He says you will be clothed in white. You'll be clothed in His righteousness. You will ne- I will never blot their name out. You will be secure for eternity. Clothed in righteousness, secured for eternity, and he will openly confess you before his Father. We should, be, we should be dying to get to that position. Pardon the pun. But to that place where his righteousness covers us, where eternity is secured, and I know that should I die today, when he opens that book, my name is there. So this morning, the question as we read Sardis, are you repentant? Are you in God's favor or are you disobedient out of his favor? Maybe it's time for you to get right with God. Just as a quick aside there, because I know somebody's probably thinking it. Does that mean that if he says, I will blot your name out of the book, that you can lose your salvation? I'm not going into that argument this morning. That's not the argument that Jesus is putting here, whether you can lose your salvation or not. What he's saying is, I'm assuring you that if you are mine, you will be with me. That's what we should be looking at. Now, most of us will go, no, no, let's rather argue, can you lose your salvation? Are you a minion? Are you Calvinist? All that stuff. All he's saying to this church, if you have stood firm and you're in the place where you need to be with me, you are assured of salvation. That's what our hope is in. That is what our hope is in. Is your name in the book this morning? Are you actually saved? How many times I've asked this in the last four years? Are you actually saved? Are you in this repentant relationship with Jesus? Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. Whoever has ears, are you listening? As a church and as an individual, are you or am I listening? Am I willing to open my heart and my mind and open myself up to Jesus saying, Barry, you're out of line. This thing that you're doing is wrong. Or have I strayed down the road of complacency where I justify my sin? Let's never be a church that allows complacency to set in. Mark Driscoll, and many will know Mark Driscoll, and his fall from grace. But he said this so many times. Churches begin with a movement. We get excited. They begin with a movement. Then sadly, they become an institution. And then they move on to being a museum. And finally end as a mausoleum filled with dead bodies. Let Westway never be a sardis, as a church and as people. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge that it is to us as a church and as Christians, as believers. Thank you that it it exposes so much in our lives this morning. Lord, you looked at a church and you had nothing good to say about them. Maybe the one thing we could take out of that was that in the church there's always a remnant of faithful. I pray that this church wouldn't be a remnant of faithful, but a church built on faithful people. One and all, every one sold out for the gospel of Jesus Christ, willing to obey your call. And so may may what we've read this morning and listened to and maybe what you've put into our hearts and into our spirits, Lord, I pray that it would would be good for us, even if it hurts, even if it challenges us, May it be good for us. And so we bless your word to each of us. May your name be glorified. May your name ever be on our lips. May we be gospel-centered, Christ-focused, and mission-determined. In Jesus' name, amen.